Hey everyone, welcome to the Tom's Hardware Podcast for July 6th, 2021. As always, I'm Tom's Hardware Editor-in-Chief, Abram Vilch, and I am joined by Associate Editor Les Pounder, Raspberry Pi expert Ash Pocket, and our very special guest, PJ Evans, who has developed, as you can see behind him, the Pi Mac. So, uh, as folks are rolling in, I just want to ask PJ, uh, how long have you been working with with Pi, and uh, how many Pies do you have? <laughs> oh, that, that's a question that scares me, Abram. Um, so uh, I was right there at the beginning, just like just like uh, yourselves. Um, I think I actually, if I just lean over here, I will pull off the wall. Raspberry Pi number one which uh, sadly is with us no more, but, uh, but they're, they're with us in spirit. Um, since then, through several misadventures of my own and also with working up with the Milton Keynes Raspberry Jam, I think we're looking somewhere in the region of about 40 Raspberry Pis in my possession, at least 20 are doing things at any given time. Um, it's basically a problem that I need to be stopped. <laughs> that might be a new place. Never to stop, never stop. <laughs> Each of us here has at least two probably has at least two dozen and if you count and if you count picos and oh rp20 third party rp2040 boards then it, it gets ex exponential right yeah that yep that is absolutely fantastic i see you have your ikea collax in really good uh really neatly laid out unlike mine which is a mess um <laughs> with it's hard organizing all of all of the boards for different projects. That's for sure. Les is really good at really good at keeping it neat. Oh, so, d definitely. Um, no. Organized is, is that was doing a lot of heavy lifting for what I've got behind me there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you created a PyMac, which is a. Yeah. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, gladly. So. I mean, there's a the long history in Raspberry Pis of let's put Raspberry Pis in, in different kinds of cases. Um, and when I started getting involved in the community, really, was uh, a number of projects of converting uh, old ZX, dead ZX Spectrum cases um, to work with Raspberry Pis and running emulators on them to sort of at least bring the keyboard and the case back to life. Uh, and that got a bit of traction. People were interested in that. I ended up writing some articles for Magpie Magazine about that. Um, and I've done a few ever since. I've put uh, an Atari 2600 emulator in a, in a cartridge with uh, all the joystick ports and all the switches and everything. Uh, that went down pretty well. But all that time, sitting uh, at the end of my workshop desk has been this thing looking at me, long since uh, broken and uh, unable to uh, be upgraded in any way. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say planned obsolescence, but you know, you, you, you have your own thoughts on that. Um, and it basically couldn't really be used for anything anymore. So um, it did start to niggle me like, you know, can you do anything with this? It's, I knew the screen was working, the hardware physically was in good shape. What, what do you do? Um, and the breakthrough was from a earlier project I did, which was to convert an original um, iPad series one uh, into uh, a bar top arcade. And I discovered that you could buy various, by various auction sites uh, converters for the LBDS connectors uh, that would basically turn them into dumb monitors uh, for about £30. And that was quite a successful project. I thought, well, hang on, what's, what's the monitor in this thing? So that's at the point that the, uh, the screwdriver came out. And, um, and I, uh, I fix it came up on the web browser and I started to take the thing apart and the thought well okay let's just take this in stages stage one is the screen any good at all can we do anything with the screen turns out it's a really really standard samsung panel and there are many choices for control units for it so um i purchased one again about i think it was about 35 pounds um had absolutely no instructions with it so i sent the first one back thinking it was broken just turned out i didn't have a clue what i was doing with it um eventually we worked out what it was doing and got the voltage correct and suddenly i had this first time when i got uh, an image up on the screen from a raspberry pi uh, so the the control unit basically breaks out the uh, lbds connector into hdmi dvi 
and um, composite and also handles the audio as well so once i got that going i thought well okay at the very least i've got a quite attractive looking retro monitor that'll do it uh, but that wasn't going to be good enough and i thought can we not only put a raspberry pi in there but also kind of get the experience close to a mac experience because what i love about these machines and what was fantastic at the time uh, i've had this one since new uh is the fact that it was one of the first ones where everything was built in um i don't know if you remember but you know around this this period of time you know sort of uh, mid 2000s you you bought a computer and then you bought 50 things that had a usb cable on them and plugged them all in to try and get yeah. them going uh, so this thing had everything. So it's got a camera, microphone, power button on the back, uh, all the ports at the back you could possibly need, USB, uh, audio, DVI out, etc., and even um, an infrared connector, a, re a receiver behind there. Because they had this really cool thing called front row. It's one of the saddest things that Apple ever did was get rid of front row, uh, which is like a sort of media plex-like media center. Uh, so I thought, okay, if we're going to do this, and it's going to be another pie in a box kind of project, how much of this original stuff can we get working? And that became the the challenge of the project. Wow, that that's impressive. Uh, Kurt asks, uh, as someone who has an iMac of similar vintage, does PJ plan to do a full build guide? Build guide once he declares the project complete. Uh, I was afraid someone was going to ask that. Uh, yes, I am absolutely going to do that. It's, it's where it's going to appear. Um, I need to talk to my Pi Magazine and see if it's something they're interested in. If, if it's uh, if it's not for them, then I'll put it on my blog. But yeah, I'm actually going to write it up because I learned quite a few things on the way about uh, how to put these things together and, and the do's and don'ts. Wow, great. That is, that is, that is fantastic. So what did you do software-wise to make it look Mac OS-like? Yeah, that was that was something I really wanted to do to give it that sort of um, that feel. So as you can see, it's got the um, I think it's a Catalina wallpaper because I really don't like the Big Sur one. Um, oh, oh yeah, that's a, a, a impromptu demo of uh, of it going. I don't know if you can see the, uh, the unfortunately the exposure is not what we want, but the little heartbeat light, which was a feature of the original, is working there as well. Um, that's been just been run off the GPIO of the of the Raspberry Pi, but that'll uh, blink away until I move the mouse again, and the screen will wake back up. Uh, so what we did, this is running um, uh, standard Raspberry Pi OS cluster, uh, but it's running uh, Ubuntu Mate instead of the the usual um, Raspberry Pi desktop, and that's because there was this wonderful theme available for it, which will give it. Um, not identical, but quite similar uh, feels and icons for um, a Mac sort of OS experience. Um, that was coupled together with uh, El Capitan, which is an icon theme, which is um, quite quite similar takes on uh, on Apple icons. And the final piece in the puzzle, which you can see at the bottom there, is the uh, the, the launch menu, uh, which is called Plank. And it's uh, quite easy to install. Um, just as a finishing touch, though you can't see it, unfortunately, I was able to change the icon to a little vector uh, Raspberry Pi logo just up there, just to give it that feel. Uh, really, really, really cool. So about how many hours do you think this took you? I stopped counting, to be honest with you. It's been one of the longer <laughs> ones. It has definitely been one of the longer ones. Um, it got really tricky at the end. Getting the, getting the screen working was fine. That wasn't uh, that wasn't too big a deal. It was then trying to fit everything in and starting to get really particular about uh, how is audio going to work. So audio was a, a, a tricky one. Uh, so the iMac has two uh, sort of pods here and here, which contain the speakers, um, and they were quite easy to remove. So I was able to buy a cheap um, six pounds amplifier from Adafruit. Um, and that wires up into just the standard 3.5 mil jack out um, and then that goes into the speakers and um, and they work just great um, but that was a really fiddly job the worst bit of all was the camera getting that working uh, that was expensive yeah because on, 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 on more of one occasion i managed to rip the ribbon cable as i was trying to install it, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Is it ribbon cables are different uh, no it's the it, hi Sorry, is it USB camera? Sorry. It is the 
Pi, uh, I forgot what it's called now. It's Pi Huts Nano Camera, Zero Cam, Zero Cam. Oh, the little one, yeah. Yeah, the little tiny one. So it actually fits into the original aperture perfectly. And there's, I was just able enough just to twist it round and then get an extended ribbon cable to take it down to the Pi. The Pi's sitting about here behind yeah. the screen. Um, so yeah, nice. um, so that's, that's all working. And the mic's just a, a USB microphone, just a cheap one, just plugged in the back. What screen resolution does that run at? Uh, it's 1920, I think, or 1200. Oh, so pretty, so pretty good resolution. Really nice. Yeah, yeah, it's really nice. Um, and I've actually found myself, normally when I'm working on the Pi projects, I'll SSH in from my machine, my regular desktop, um, and work away on that. But I've found myself quite happily sitting at this and, and working away on it. It's, it's, it's you are cracking the little desktop. So that's that's a Pi four with four or eight gigabytes. Uh, yeah, it's four gig. Yeah, yeah. Pi four with four gig. So it's um, thankfully there's some quite a lot of ventilation at the back, so that I can feel the heat coming off that now. It's quite warm. Yeah. I'm hoping all the hot glue holding it in place uh, holds up. Ah, that's great. Uh, Martin Parker says, "Looks good, PJ. I've used a few display driver boards on my projects, like my Oak Pi laptop." Very cool. Very, very cool. We like to see laptop. So what are some of the other projects you've done where you've put the Pi in things? You mentioned an Atari cartridge. Uh, yeah, if you'll excuse me, I'll um, I'll just grab it. And you can... Uh, so that's the Atari it was uh, based on. So yep. is this less so, than $400 uh, in price? Sorry, say again? Is, it, is this less than $400 in price, like the Atari uh, BCS <laughs> yeah. console you can get now? Yeah, did that actually ever get released? Yes. Yes, we're reviewing one yeah. right now. Spoiler alert: we have a lot of issues with the part that's not a t that lets you do computer things. The Atari part runs okay. The yeah, forty dollars to play Atari probably. is a little bit crazy. <laughs> well, this this was certainly a lot cheaper. There you go. There it is. Nice. So that that is a, a, a dead cartridge. Uh, but it's got all the functionality of the original, so you can select your difficulties and player A and player B. Uh, you've got your reset buttons, you've got your joystick connectors, um, and that's just uh, Raspberry Pi Zero. Wow! So I have to and ask the about the connectors. Those are those are the are those the original Atari style connectors? Yeah, yeah, nine pin Ds. Yeah. How do you make that so, work with a Raspberry Pi? Uh, a lot of GPIO work. Uh, thankfully, yeah. there's there's so many GPIO lands available. The, the, I, I thought if this is going to be uh, tricky, but Atari joysticks only have up to, uh, the axis and the fire button, so mm. we don't have loads of different fire buttons. So you only you only need five each and a ground. So what's it running? RetroPie? Uh, yes. Yeah, actually, no, actually, no, it isn't. This one actually just goes straight into Stellar. Ah. Uh, so so it's nice and fast to boot. Okay. Good. Yeah. Wow. That is. Is it just Atari, or do you have anything else on there that it can work with if you wanted to connect, like maybe a Bluetooth controller or something like that? You, you could. You could. I just want, I wanted this to be a sort of a pure project. <laughs> I wanted yes, to I get you. Just, just Atari. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, with the real joysticks, that, you know, that's. Yeah, that's, well, it works fine with the original joysticks, yeah. That's fantastic. Do you have a problem sourcing the original joysticks? I mean. Um, there's two behind me. Because <laughs> we, were, we were talking at our staff meeting today about one of the big things about the Atari VCS is you get the realistic feeling joystick. And there are some third party ones that claim to that are USB that say that they're like the Atari joystick, but don't look exactly like it. So it's, it's cool that you get to play with the real with the real stuff. I personally really miss playing breakout with the paddle. Oh, the paddles. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Keep thinking yeah, that, I ought to be able to create that. Yeah, that, that would be tricky with Raspberry Pi and Nano, though. Um, that might be uh, a way a way of uh, addressing it. Yeah. That no, analog input. Yeah, I mean, one ought to be able to easily do that, right? Because it's just a potentiometer. Uh, oh, I, said, I said Nano, didn't I? I meant Pico. Yes, but it's just it's just a potentiometer. So all you need to mm. you know do is is make a potentiometer, right? That's that's fantastic. So are there any other cool things that you put? put a pie into Ooh. besides the cartridge uh well several um i mean I, another one where i went to uh sorry excuse me again where i went decided to go too far this is um the dead expansion plus 
from oh, Nice. Oh, nice. So that's where I'm from. Um, so this one was a project for Magpie, and I've done these before. In fact, it's a bit like you know, you always have your pet project. You always have that, that one you keep going back to, and like let's let's do a version two, let's do a version three, and, and Spectrum seems to be mine. Um, so this one I decided to get uh, really particular on. So if you look at the back. So we've actually re reproduced the output. So we've got the uh, composite output, audio, both in and out. So you can actually load tapes into the thing. Then we cheat a bit. You can see the, uh, the Raspberry Pi sitting there. But also, yeah. if you want to use an original Spectrum power supply, uh, it will take a 9-volt input and power it off that. Oh, nice. that's very nice. Wow. So, do so you, that's, what are you uh, using for the emulator for that? Is there a particular... Like Emulator? Yeah, I, I I use Fuse. It's a uh, it's a really nice emulator. Uh, others are available, but uh, Fuse always seems to be like the most compatible and, and the easiest to work with. Uh, hmm. PJ, yeah. have you heard of ZX Bear emulator? Yes, that's the Bear Metal one, isn't it? Yeah, I've been using that one recently. That's pretty good. It loads really fast. Yeah, yeah, it's very impressive. Um, I was very honoured actually because the original article I did for Magpie where I laid out how to do the matrixing of the keys and get them into a sensible amount of GPIOs. He actually implemented that in the code. Yeah, so if you wire up the GPIOs to the, to the to matrix, it will uh, it will work with the with that bit of design. Have you tried yeah. playing a tape on it? Yeah, yeah, it works. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I think what we should do now is have you load something on tape and we'll all just sit here and wait for it to load. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just listen, turn the volume up, we'll listen to the banging, the, the, whatever you call those yeah. like data Fancy noises. Whales. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember I had a, a Texas Instruments uh, 99 4A and it did, did the same thing. Uh, fond memories of getting Compute Magazine. I don't know if you guys had that in the UK. You had to, they had totally. programs in BASIC written yeah. out and you had to type them in. And if you made a typo, huh? You'd be in trouble. Uh, but what you always had to do was wait till the next month's issue came out, so they would correct the typos. Uh, <laughs> see, I couldn't tell if it was theirs or mine, right? Uh, so, yeah, what a what what fun we really we missed those days. So, speaking of of tinkering, Les, you've been playing with something that is called the Tinker Board. I have indeed, yes, the Asus Tinkerboard 2S I've been playing around with. Uh, it's um, one of Asus new boards for single board computers. Really, it's a Raspberry Pi, but with their own hardware. So I'm just going to go to the detail screen to talk about it with a bit more authority. So Rockchip RK3399 is the system on chip, and that's got a big little configuration. So we've got two big ARM Cortex uh, A72 cores at 2 gig, and then four smaller ones at 1.5 gig. So it's got plenty of poke, it will go really well. GPU, ARM Mali, T860, 800 megahertz. Okay, that's good. Two gig of RAM, that's okay. These days we're used to more like four gig, for like a Raspberry Pi 4, which is what we like. But it has got storage, onboard storage. So the 2S has 16 gig of eMMC storage, which is built in, ready to go, and you can flash it by plugging in a USB-C connection from your computer and also a 19 volt or 12 to 19 volt DC power supply as well. It appears as a drive, you just send flash using Etcher, the OS, and away you go. Uh, it's got Wi-Fi, as you'd expect, Bluetooth 5, gigabit Ethernet. All the ports are USB 3.2. It's the only device I own that has a USB 3.2. Uh, we have one USB-C port, as, well, as I mentioned, which also does display port. So we can have two outputs, one via HDMI, the other via this USB-C port. We've got a camera connection, CSI, just like the Raspberry Pi's uh, camera. I'm going to test that camera very soon. And we've got a DSI port for the display, official Raspberry Pi display. I'm going to see if I can find my display and plug it in. Um, also, we've got a 40-pin GPO, very similar to Raspberry Pi's GPO, but I'm having a few problems at the minute getting it to work. But I've got some things to show you anyway. I've been busy. So here is a new overhead cam that hopefully won't crash. There we go, it's working. And you can see there is a Tinkerboard 2S connected up. Um, that's the heatsink to keep it cool. It does get rather warm when you push it quite hard. On the left is a Wi-Fi card, and it's replaceable. If we want to get new Wi-Fi cards, put it straight in. 
And I've been playing around with some code today. And this is written in Bash using Wiring Pi. So Wiring Pi is, it's, it used to be a very popular um, way to write code for the GPIO. And it underpins pretty much all the GPIO libraries you can find on the Pi. It's one of the, I think it's the, the factories, the pin factories, they call it. Ben Nussel will correct me one day on that one. But I've written in the top left, you can see some code. This is written in Bash, which is what we use for working on the uh, Linux terminal. Other emulators and terminal emulators are available. So we've got bin bash to start it all going. And then I say GPIO mode 29, is that? Out. It's very small on my screen, sorry. And that's saying pin 29, which is the bottom right pin, strangely, is an output pin. I then echo a message to the screen saying, hello, Tom's hardware, press the button. And then I say pin 28 is an input, and that's connected to the button here. I then use while true, so a forever loop. Look at the button. What's it doing? Read the button. Is it been pressed? Yes or no? One zero. Echo the button's current state. If it's been pressed, so one, if it's connected to three volts, it will send pin 28 high. Then turn pin 29 on. Print on the screen, LED on. Sleep for half a second. If it hasn't been pressed the button, then it will say turn 29 off. Say LEDs off and then sleep for half a second. So I can run this code now, so you can see it in operation. So I'm running the GPIO as root pseudo power I've got here. It's the only way I've been able to get things to work. So as you'll see now, let me turn the light off. There you go. You can see the LED is lit. Finger off. On. That's the limit of what I've got today. There is no Python library at this time to get that to work. But I am making inquiries with ACES and also uh, Blitz City Wing, who wrote the book on the original Tinkerboard to see if I can get something to work for our review. But on the whole, it is a really powerful single board computer. It's more powerful than a Pi 4, but only just. But then we have to justify the price. This is $129 versus a Raspberry Pi 4 8 gig, which is what, $75? five eighty dollars i think roughly so it's a lot more money you've got extra cores on the cpu but you've got less ram you've got built-in emmc flash you've got usb c uh, you know i'm i have to say so far it doesn't look very impressive to me because you do have more cores but they're but they're lower quality cores they're like the cortex a53 yeah. so it's got two Whereas I think all four Raspberry Pi four cores are are seventy two are are a seventy two is right so so you're actually getting only two of the higher quality cores that you would get four of on on Raspberry Pi yeah yes they operate two gigahertz but we can overclock Pi to two gigahertz easily yeah uh, and like everything else support is the name of the game like if you can't get good libraries and good software it's it's worthless also yeah. the usb 3.2 thing isn't as exciting as it sounds because usb 3.2 by the way when i talk i talk to the usb implementer forum folks uh periodically and they always want to say please don't use the version number like usb 3.2 or 3.1 just talk about the speed and USB 3.2 Gen 1 is the same as USB 3. It's 5 gigabits, 5 Gbps. So it is not, there is no advantage to it. If it were quote unquote Gen 2, then that would be 10 gigabit per second max, and then you would have something. But you're, you don't really have anything except that you have a USB C port, which, yeah. which the Pi uses for charging instead, although you can use it for host mode. But you're not getting higher speeds in the transfer. Yeah. You have to use a proprietary charger rather than a USB-C universal charger to, to power it. You have to have a heat sink. You, the Wi-Fi is not built into the chipset. It's a separate thing. I, I don't um, see, I don't see the great advantage here. But taking away all the hardware, so it's just two bare boards, just like looking at two cars that look pretty similar. 
what is the biggest thing between the two of them is community and support. So I was looking through the Tinkerboard forums today and this, the last post was from June and it was asking questions that were being unanswered, which is leading me to think there's not the greatest level of support in the community. It's not been adopted. Admittedly, it's quite a new board, but this has happened before with the original Tinkerboard, which I got many years ago. That came out and a bit of a fanfare, but then it sort of went very quiet. Whereas Raspberry Pi, yes, we, we're all fans of it, and that's why we're here. But it has a sustained community that's been there since day one, and it's still growing. And all of these people are helping one another to make cool projects like PyMac. Right, exactly. Nobody's going to make a PyMac, or, or no one's going to make a Tinker Mac. It's, or an it's Odoid not, Mac. <laughs> right. It's not going to happen. And that's why, or even most likely an NVIDIA Jetson Mac, right? Uh, yeah. So that's that's the problem. You got to, you know, it's the people. It's people like PJ that make Raspberry Pi mm -hmm. what it is. And, and that's why even if they did have significantly better specs, like the Jetson has some better specs. The Jetson Nano has some better specs, depending on which one you get. Yeah, you're still not going to to beat to beat Raspberry Pi because it's the community that matters. Yeah. And speaking of the community, Ash has once again gathered together the best projects from the community. Yeah, it's already that time again. Once a month, we share a list of the top ten Raspberry Pi projects that we've had the honor of featuring over the last month. And if you want to view the full list, you can find it at tomshardware.com. But to get you guys excited, I've picked three of my favorite projects to share. So let's not waste any time. I'm going to switch my screen over here to show you this Raspberry Pi Boppet Minecraft controller. This guy put a Raspberry Pi Pico inside of a Boppet. And the Pico is recognized as a standard controller by a computer whenever it's connected. I think it's through Bluetooth. You'll have to double check the article to confirm that one. Uh, but the input for the controller is carried out using the original Boppet controls. And that's sort of in the same spirit of PJ's project using the original hardware whenever you can. And he actually successfully had a test run in Minecraft using this Boppet controller. And I thought it was just too fantastic. It, it's just really hilarious. I mean, I've I did, I've never considered using a Boppet as a controller. thought that was a good idea. Now, you might be wondering how you move forward, like left, right, and then round, right, to move around in the game. He included an accelerometer so that you can just tilt the controller to move around. So next up, I wanted to show you guys this Raspberry Pi Pico library that offers support for VGA output on the Pico. This is really cool. I think that this shows well, I, th I think it's, I'm sorry. I think it's a really useful library for the community. There's a lot of potential that comes with it. And I'm really looking forward to what applications, you know, people show that they can do with this library. Um, the Pi community, like we've said before, people do things with Raspberry Pi because they can, not necessarily because they should. And this is a really good example of pushing the boundaries with the Raspberry Pi Pico. And last up, I had I had to share this one. I'm sure Les knows exactly which one I'm about to show you guys. This is a Raspberry Pi powered Game Boy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this bad boy is so much more intense than the retro flag G Pi case. It's using an actual Game Boy. And again, with the spirit of PJ's project, it's using the original buttons. It's using the original screen and it can play original cartridges and custom cartridges including doom this person managed to this maker managed to put uh doom onto a cartridge and it can be played on this original game boy with the help of raspberry pi and i thought that was just absolutely incredible and i want to know what do you guys think do you think these projects are awesome or what like what do you need to run doom on next oh, doom's been on everything now it's been on pregnancy tests game boys everything <laughs> Uh, hey. PJ probably sees his next project here, right? Because uh, you oh, haven't put that, something in the that, Game Boy yet. That, that Game Boy is beautiful. Um, yes, I would certainly be reading up on that. That looks fantastic. For for those who want to spend less effort, I have here the uh, Retro Flag GPI case, which allows you to take a Raspberry Pi Zero 
or zero W, put it in this little cartridge slot here, plug it in, use some, use some, I think, double A batteries and install whatever software you want, such as RetroPie and, and run it off of this. And it's, it's really straightforward and easy to use. Um, but it's not a real Game Boy, right? Um, uh, speaking of, uh, one more thing we wanted to show today is something my son and I just put together and we started playing with yesterday. And this is the new Adafruit RP2040 macro keypad. So this is really cool. I think that right now, so far, it looks like this is better than any of the other macro keypads we've tried, even the Kibo RP2040 from Pimeroni, which is very nice and has more keys, but this has a lot of extra features. So this has a rotary encoder here. It has a screen and it has a built-in speaker. It also has on the side here, a uh, Stemma QT port so you can attach other things to it so um the i just got this the other day the you can buy this either as a complete kit which comes with the keycaps and the switches or you can buy just the board and then buy other stuff so i got the board and i got the uh kit the sort of design kit which gives you this plate for putting the switches into the board and the back plate here and the uh, cover for the rotary encoder, but I got I brought my own switches because the switches that they sell in the kit are red lin linear switches, which I don't like. So I have here my Kale Jade switches. Any Cherry MX compatible switch will do. Uh, and I have and Adafruit even has a special keypad library for Circuit Python. So. Uh, I have not programmed anything cool right now to go on the LED screen, but I have programmed this to play music. So uh, if you can hear it well enough, we can do. Uh, 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 you can hear me play, play smoke on the water, which is all I can play. And uh, so each, so I programmed it. So each of these keys is A through A through G. And then if you want a sharp, you can hold down this and you'll get a sharp, that, that uh, letter with a sharp. And what I'm gonna program it to do is when you rotate the rotary encoder, you'll get a different, you'll get different octaves. So you can do octaves. Uh, so it's, uh, I really, I really love this. I'm really enjoying it. The only downer was it was a little hard to press in, uh, to press in the key, the key switches because it's hot swappable and have them stay. But once my son got them really in nicely and we try not to abuse it, it seems to stay pretty, pretty well. Uh, we'll just make sure my, my two-year-old daughter doesn't grab this and run around with it like she does with the Kibo uh, all the time. But it's, uh, we'll, we'll put up a review of this, uh, but so far I have to say it's highly recommended. It does a lot of cool things. And of course the obvious use of it would not be to play music, but would be to create all kinds of macros for things like OBS or uh, whatever, you, whatever you want to do. Uh, so what do you guys think? It's nice, very yeah. nice. Very nice. Yeah. yeah, I think it's also a bit cheaper than the, uh, than the Kibo. It's the, the board itself is uh, in U.S. dollars is thirty to, is thirty dollars, and then I think you you want the you probably do want to get the kit with this plate on it and the back plate, and that's another five dollars. So thirty five dollars if you already have your own key switches that you want to and caps that you want to put into it. If not, I think it's like forty five dollars to get it with uh, switches and caps. But I like these clicky switches better than the linear ones they give you in. The, kit so anyway uh that was your, uh, your sharp button that's very clever you could actually make like play and play like an instrument with that yeah that's that's the idea right yeah if you really hold cool. you hold it down and then it hurt now the next but it thing also that demonstrates that you can hold down a button and get multiple presses out of it yeah so that um, was the thing i figured out like a half an hour before the show was how to code it so it would look 
to see if that button is pressed when you press the other button. Um, but it wasn't that difficult. The next one thing that my son and I want to do is turn this into kind of a music learning game. So we'll take songs and then we'll like have it light up the light up the right key for you to press and then you've got to press it or, or whatever so you can play along. Mm. So uh, that's that's something that that's something that we'll that we'll try to do. I mean it's not a great speaker, it's the equivalent of a piezo buzzer, although it can play wave files. I don't know if you can play wave files with a piezo buzzer. Uh, yeah, you can. It's it's very crude, but you can do it. Yeah. So I don't think it's a really good, great speaker, but you know, it's uh, that wasn't really the purpose of the main purpose of this pad, but still, it's pretty cool. Um, anyway, I really want to thank PJ for joining us today, and all of you for watching and listening. You can catch us here at two thirty p.m. Eastern, seven thirty p.m. British time uh, every Tuesday and next week's special guest is going to be Raspberry Pi founder Evan Upton as we celebrate the one year anniversary of this show. So uh, please join us then and uh, we look forward to, to seeing you next time. Bye everyone. <laughs>